Good evening. Uh, welcome tonight. We continue our study of the uh, seven signs. That is how John uh, refers to the uh, miracles in the Gospel of John. Tonight I want to uh, begin number four. Uh, again, the first three, the water into wine. I believe the sign is that of conversion. Uh, the healing of the nobleman's son is faith which is the key to conversion. The healing of the invalid, we finished that last week. The key concept there was the walk. And just as Jesus specifically selected a man who could not walk and gave him the ability to walk, that is his desire for us after he convert, after we are converted. The Christian life is a walk. Tonight again, we start the fourth sign, the feeding of the 5,000, sometimes it's referred to as the miraculous feeding. Uh, both titles would be uh, correct. This is probably, not only in John, but of all of the miracles, the best known. And simply because of coverage, if you will. There are 36 recorded miracles in the public ministry and again, keep in mind that those 36 miracles occurred within 44 days. Wow. And it just shows us what the public ministry was. I believe it was just this continual display of the miraculous. But 36 are recorded. Of the 36, this is the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels. And we don't know why necessarily, but it's the only one uh, that is. Matter of fact, if you, you study all four Gospels, there are only eight or nine things that are recorded in all four of them. And so just so from a coverage perspective, uh, Matthew devotes seven verses to it. Mark devotes 13. Luke uh, about six, which is interesting when you consider Luke's eye for detail, and John devotes 14 for a total of 40. Some unique things about the miracle, it is the only one in which the disciples are involved other than the Gospel of John. It impacts probably more than any, anyone else did, in that the crowd knows where the food comes from, and they, they react. It raises messianic fever to a new level. And particularly, John points that out, that they try to force him to become king. And that's every politician's dream, isn't it? You know, be our emperor, rule over us. And so they know what was uh, going on. In the Chronology-wise, and again, keep in mind that John is, is not chronological. That's not his intent. And so within the Gospel of John, from John 5 to John 6, probably two years go by, we know from Matthew, Mark, and Luke that the feeding of the 5,000 occurs at the end of the Galilean ministry. And so what is at the end of the second year, might have been at the beginning of the third year, exact times are hard uh, to pinpoint. It would appear that the next major event is the Mount of Transfiguration. And then we begin to funnel into that Jerusalem journey, which is what we've been studying on uh, Sunday morning. It is spring. We are told that it is at the time of the Passover. Let's jump in at John's text. And beloved, because this is so well known, I am just going to draw from the various passages without specific references because you can check all those things out. Uh, they are up in uh, Bethsaida, which is up in the northeast corner of Jerusalem. Uh, a great multitude follow him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And, uh, you know, but what we also need to recognize, Luke records 
It was not just a sermon. It was not just a feeding that day. There was healing that was going on. And there were these marvelous aspects of divine power uh, that is being uh, shown. Uh, next slide, please. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company. Now we know that there are 5,000 men. That does not include the women and children. And uh, most scholars estimate at least 20,000 maybe 25,000. I mean, in Maine, we call that a city. Uh, it's just, uh, particularly in that rural part. Bethsaida, in the Greek, means the hunting place. Uh, it sounds like a cool place to me. But it was, again, as remote. And this is significant, beloved. And one of the things I want to try to focus in on tonight, it would appear that as the day wore on, the disciples attempt to get Jesus to cut it off. It's time to end. Earlier in the day, Jesus then sees the company. One of the authors records he has great compassion, and he says to Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, he's not picking on Philip, but we know from John chapter 1, Philip is from this area. And so, it's his backyard, if you will. He knows where the grocery stores are. He knows where the restaurants are, and things like that. It was logical to ask this question. It is, again, of the 41 questions in the Gospel of John, this is one of 41. Uh, all are intriguing, uh, beloved. And many of the miracles involved a question. And this he said to prove himself, for he himself knew what he would do. In other words, he's, he wants Philip to think. And the implication is, at least Andrew and maybe some of the other disciples heard the question as well. Philip... This guy can do math in his head. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, that's one of the things, and you'll, you'll forgive me for digressing, that's one of the things that frustrates me and sometimes humors me about our culture. People can't do math in the head anymore. And sometimes, just so I have a sermon illustration, you know, I'll give somebody change and just to see if they can do it or not. And it, it's some, again, uh, don't do it if you're in a hurry. <laughs> Uh, because they won't be able to do it. But it's just, you know, again, it's like a calf looking at a new gate. Uh, what am I supposed to do with this anyway? Well, because I like to work in round numbers. I usually keep a pocket full of change. It's just one of the little weird idiosyncrasies of me. And whenever I can do the exact change, I like to do the exact change. And when I get stuff back, I don't like to get change. I like to get bills. And, and so, but anyway, it's just kind of, you know, you know my weirdnesses, things like that. But I love this guy. He can do math in his head. 200 penny worth. Let me make that real for you. Eight months salary. He, he know. I don't know if he had a catering background or what. But he's aware of how many people are there. He's aware of food cost. And he says, Lord, if we had eight months salary, that that wouldn't even begin to provide appetizers. Wow. And it's not likely that the, the treasury of the disciples at this point in time had anywhere near eight months of salary. I don't know, Dennis, did I go beyond that? Thank you. And one of his disciples, Andrew, and again, we know that Andrew was always bringing somebody to Christ, which is really cool. Simon Peter's brother said unto him, there's a lad here, again, a little boy. He had five barley loaves, two small fishes. But what are these amongst so many? And beloved, again, I'm not going to beat it up, but as we know, loaves, is, it's a biscuit, it's a cracker. It's not loaves as we think of it today, and even if it were, 
amongst 25,000, it's not going to go very far. This is the little boy's lunch. It's what it is. And, and so we, we kind of put things together. We have this large crowd. We have no resources in the area. We're in a remote part of the country. The disciples urge Jesus to begin to wind down so people will have several hours of daylight to get back home, or at least to get within the reach of resources. Jesus continues to ask those questions to get them to think and continues to teach to get them to think. Now, the phrase that is often used here and the phrase that I use as well, and I do not know with whom it originates, but basically with Philip and Andrew, they're calculating, beloved, but they're calculating without Christ. And I think that's one of the major lessons that we learn from this account. Logically, physically, from a human perspective, are their math skills on? And the answer is yes. You know, when, when, when Philip said it would take eight months' salary just to provide appetizers, Jesus did not refute that. Yep, and it shows the magnitude of the need but well, beloved, they aren't doing their spiritual math correctly. And that is one of the things that Jesus wants them to think about. Principle here, beloved. Negative circumstances often blur the power, the greatness, and the resources of God. Negative circumstances, we often focus in on what we can't do, not what he can do. And this passage, I think, is a key of one of the classic negative circumstances that Christians have faced down through the ages. And the horizontal circumstances will vary, but the common denominator is usually the same. A great need, minimal resources. You ever been there? And I suspect you have. And you're in really good company. Because so many times, again, in the Word of God and in history and in our lives, many of God's people have found themselves within that circumstances, there was a great need and there were minimal resources. It might have been in the area of physical strength, it might have been in a military situation. It might have been in money. But that's it. And I would suggest to you, beloved, that when we find ourselves in that type of a situation where there is great need and minimal resources, we need to be careful of our spiritual calculations. Physically, they may be accurate. But if we aren't including the God factor in the equation, then the equation is not complete. Think, and I'm not trying to bust on these guys tonight, the disciples that is, because I've been there. I've done this. And it, it, it makes me you know, disgusted with myself because I see myself in this passage. These men now, and I'm thankful the synoptic authors it kind of established this for us. These men have been with Jesus now for almost two full years. What have they seen? What have they witnessed? Wow. They've seen many instances. Great need. Minimal resources. We know from the synoptic authors, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these men have just returned from their first term missions trip. They were finally ready to get kicked out of the nest. I don't think for very long. But they return and they're amazed at what they did. They were amazed at what they saw. And I think that's why Jesus is, quote, testing them here. Because he already knows what he's going to do. But beloved, isn't it 
amazing that a miracle is not even on their radar. They have not included the divine in any way, shape, or form. They are still viewing this purely from a, a physical or for a human perspective. And again, my limitations do not limit him. And the same is true of all of us. It is not what we can't do. It is what he can and does do. And I think it's one of the primary focal points of the account. It's the, the dullness, if you will, of the disciples. The day lingers on. Supper time, let's say. And it's time to feed the crowd. And Jesus says to them, before he does anything, you are going to feed them. And that will come true. Number one, he gives two commands. Bring the boys' lunch to me. Organize the crowd. And so, and organize the men. And so the men, we know, are organized in groups of 50. And that means there would have been uh, 100 of them. I think that's done for the sake of order. The, the women and the children would have been separate. And again, beloved, that was simply the custom of the day. In a public setting, men didn't eat with women and children. In their home, they did, but not at a banquet or anything like that. So Jesus is teaching this, treating this like a formal occasion, even though it is a picnic, if you will. We are told, we get the image, it's sort of a hillside, it's a very grassy area, beautiful, uh, would have been an ideal place to sit. And the idea of organizing them into groups or companies or rows, for some of you who have a green thumb, it's the idea of, of a garden row, of where you plant a crop. And so again, when God does something, he is not the order of con author of confusion. It is always done in an orderly way. Uh, this is no exception. Jesus is keeping uh, within the customs of the day. And that's the pattern within the scripture. As far as the miracle, beloved, we, we aren't told. The only explanation that I can give, the only explanation that I could find, that as Jesus took the boy's lunch, barley, by the way, was the food of the poor. It was less nutritious than wheat. It was animal food, is what it was. And so this is, a, this is a poor boy. Again, his mother you know, had the foresight to, to pack him a lunch. And that as Jesus took the lunch, he gives thanks for it. He begins to distribute it, and there is a supernatural multiplication in his hands. And it's a God thing. And it just shows what happens when we put things in the Lord's hands. He still can and he still does supernatural things. The disciples that day are his wait staff. Jesus is the producer. They distribute. And no doubt it would have taken time to feed 20 or 25,000 people like that uh, just, you know, on foot and, uh, and things like that. But everybody knew, beloved, what happened. One of the evidences of the miracle, the authors are very specific to tell us everyone ate until they were satisfied or until they were full. And it's almost a little bit of humor, if you will, it's an agricultural term. It's the pictures of a farm animal at a trough. 
Doesn't mean they committed gluttony or anything. But guess what? Nobody went away hungry. <laughs> and again, that's what happens when Jesus meets a need. The need will be completely met. And then, beloved, not only that, there were leftovers, baskets. And if we study the Greek, it isn't like an Easter basket. The idea was, and I've demonstrated this before, it's the idea, I would call it, you know, the old main pack basket, which many of you have seen, uh, which in that actually didn't originate in Maine. It, ancient, it uh, initiated in ancient Rome because it was a human dump truck. It was how they carried gravel and rocks and, and things like that on their back. And Rome had a phenomenal infrastructure. But that's the picture that's used here. Basically, there were 12 backpacks or pack baskets of food. And we aren't told directly, but I believe that it was for the disciples. And it, because they needed to learn the lesson that day. Uh, just, just a phenomenal thing that occurs. But beloved, when God meets a need, he meets a need. One of the things about this miracle and I think because it's so popular, it in some ways is attacked, and people try to, quote, explain it away. And here are a couple of the more popular uh, fallacies, if you will. One is that the generosity of the boy, you know, shamed or somehow touched the hearts of other people, and they took their lunches out too, and everybody ate. And that is nowhere in the passage. Another one, uh, one of my favorites, uh, and again, folks, you just wonder what people are thinking about when they write stuff like this, is that Jesus hypnotized the crowd, and they thought they were full. Well, that's a greater miracle than, than feeding them, isn't it? Because, you know, the power to hypnotize 25,000 people all at one time. And, and again, I think when people come up with stuff like this, they just don't even follow through all of their implications. A scholar that I had ran into, I'm not familiar with the individual. It was one of my older resources. Uh, his last name was Vanderloosh. I love this quote. It is without a doubt fascinating business to investigate how human ingenuity reaches new heights in its efforts to eliminate the supernatural from the story of the feeding. And that's it. It is indeed fascinating with what people will come up with to try to explain this miracle. You will not eliminate. It is a supernatural act, beloved, pure and simple. And an attempt to turn it into anything else is to deny the truth and the power of God. And the crowd knew what happened that day. I think the progression is this. And we'll begin to focus in on this next week. And it's logical. We have conversion accomplished by faith continues in a walk, but beloved, to walk, we need sustenance, we need food, we need bread. And that's what Jesus Christ is. He's the bread of life. And so we're going to look at some bread principles starting next week. I have two different categories. I think there are physical things that we need to learn from the miracle, and I think that there are spiritual things that we can learn from the miracle. And I have a list in both categories. Some requests tonight as we take some uh, time to...